Hello everyone, you're watching the New World News Network. I'm Jamie Starr, and this is the third installment of Communist Propaganda's Greatest Hits. This one will be covering comic books and the social engineering and propaganda aspect of them. I do want to say the first two installments of this series you can no longer find on YouTube. The first episode, uh, Melissa Harris Perry had five views and then was shut down by NBC. The second installment, Exploiting Children for Political Agendas, was shut down by BuzzFeed because I used one of their clips. Both of these, I've been not notified. I was informed by friends that they were being blocked. So YouTube has no, as far as the me and YouTube dialogue, I'm, I guess, supposed to not know that this is going on. So I can't approach them about it. I feel like it infringes on journalists' ability to report on things and to display what they're criticizing. So both of those videos hopefully soon will end up on Vimeo, and I'll also have them on torrent sites because there's always a way around these things. And if YouTube is going to turn into a safe space, everyone will just go elsewhere. So that being said, let's hope this video doesn't get blocked by Marvel or Disney. Um, considering they are both one company now, and we know Disney is a grand empire. So, comic books have always been used as propaganda. I do enjoy comic books, but I also am aware that what I'm seeing has a point it's trying to get across. So, Disney bought out Marvel. What does it all mean? Well, we're going to find that out, because since they've bought the company, they've decided to change around a couple things about the characters. We know, though, that comics have always boomed during times of war, World War II. Here you see Disney making propaganda for both sides of World War II. This was a movie, anti-Hitler, um, starring Donald Duck, him throwing a rotten tomato at Hitler, but you also see Donald Duck here as a Nazi reading Mein Kampf and the story of one of Hitler's children, as adapted from Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf was a Hitler biography, sort of, I believe it means my life, or uh, my mind, something to that extent, I forget exactly. Um, educa education for Death, a norm another Walt Disney picture. So Disney, you know, is obviously morally lacking, just going to make movies for whoever's paying them the most. And Superman got in on the Nazi action, fighting against Hitler. Uh, again, comic books boom during times of war. People are dis disillusioned, disenfranchised, and they like to look towards different fantasy heroes to inspire them or make them, you know, give them hope. Uh, Superman has been used to try to uh, promote recruitment for the army, get money for the Red Cross, sell stamps and bonds. And you also see in this picture with him, Superman, Batman, Robin, it says, Sink the Jap and Nazis. So the Japanese and Nazis were linked in this propaganda. Superman, the latest movies, Man of Steel, has been used as a recruitment tool as well. So this is still going on. It's quite obviously still going on. And this is going to continue. In the upcoming Batman vs. Superman movie, they brought in 8,500 military extras. Captain America, he got in on the action, fighting against Hitler. So both DC and Marvel were, were doing this. Captain America, we'll get into how Disney has uh, changed him around a bit later in this. Here you see him rescuing Bucky from a Japanese missile that he is strapped to. You have Daredevil, Daredevil getting in on the action, fighting against Hitler. And the Marines even had their own comic book. Here you see a uh, depiction of an Asian man. And even Dr. Seuss got in on the action, trying to sell savings bonds and stamps. So this is nothing new, but this is new Captain America. And you see this, it says, look at your future. Are these ignorant rednecks the goal of your American dream? And you see Red Skull holding what appears to be Alex Jones with a ponytail, and then the rest of this is where you have this group, which is basically looks like the Cobra Commanders of G.I. Joe, saying, attention all trespassers, I am the Supreme Serpent. By invading this sovereign land, you defy the laws of God, nature, and the United States Constitution. And so the uh, storyline here 
is that there are immigrants and refugees trying to cross the American border, and that there's this group of serpent mercenaries fighting them off, because it's obviously unconstitutional to just open up your borders like this. For years we've had an immigration process, so it, you know, implies that there's a illegal activity going on, and Captain America comes in to the rescue of the migrants, and fighting on their behalf, which gets him dubbed Captain Socialism. So you see that once Disney got involved, you had Captain America immediately go from fighting, well not immediately, but over time has gone from fighting the Nazis to being a Nazi, because all Nazi means is National Socialist. Nationalism, Captain America, Socialism, these ideas he is now fighting on behalf of. Wonder Woman, she was the original feminist comic book superhero. Here you see her freeing women from uh, chains, you know, talking against war, hate, greed, and lust for power. Free yourselves, um, you can do it. Although feminists have also criticized the way Wonder Woman was depicted as being overtly sexual, having her always tied up to train tracks or something like that. And it just kind of shows you that these women are never happy. They are never satisfied. If it's not done by their, their way, then it's wrong. And they will find a problem in anything. Nowadays, though, Thor has been turned into a female and is a feminist. And during this little bit, you have a dialogue where... He says, Thor, are you kidding me? You want me to call you Thor? Damn feminists ruin everything. And she ends up knocking the guy out and saying, that's for saying feminist like it's a four-letter word. So, they've changed Thor, they changed Captain America, and then they immediately decide it's best for them to make out. So, I think this is unnecessary and just kind of... I don't know. I don't know if it was shock factor or if it was over the top, but you see how it's interesting because the two guys up at the top are who you think of now when you hear of these characters. So if you read a headline, Thor and Captain America share a kiss in the relaunch of Avengers, you immediately think about those two actors kissing because those are the two faces most associated with them. The X-Men... Um, does have a homosexual kind of uh, undertone to it. It's been said, even by the producers, they've come out and said it was part of how Ian McKellar became a part of the movie because they believed that a persecuted minority of powerful mutants struggling to coexist in society were perfect stand-ins for the current struggles of the LGBT people. And that it's not just a fantasy story, but it's a parable. That's why in the second X-Men movie, when you have the scene with Iceman and his parents, it is a coming out scene. It's meant to be that way. It's meant to be perceived that way. The undertone is not there. It's an overtone. And this has even gone into the comic books um, now. Brian Singer, the director of these movies, though, was charged with sexual abuse in a... Uh, Incident that I guess involved a house party of sorts, and you hear about this in Hollywood, whether it be the Corey talking about that's why the other Corey ended up going down the dark path he did, or Jimmy Savile, the casting couch, um, you hear about the rumors of homosexuality and hip hop, and it in this story, you had a house party where younger guys were brought in, you know, obviously with the promise of getting into the business, and they were given drugs and then basically gangbanged and raped by all these Hollywood execs, and because these same people control the media, it's very rare for you to hear about it in the extent it is. And that's one of the things. Uh, proportions of reality are completely abstracted by the media and television. So, as I said, the spread into the comic book, you had them have Iceman come out as gay in a new issue where he's talking to Jean, he's questioning himself, his sexuality, is he gay, is he bi, and she's like, no, you're gay, we all knew it, it's alright. Again, nothing wrong with people being gay. I have a problem with it being used, though, as a political tool. Uh, homosexuals are only 3.8% of the population, 
we should keep that in mind. And as we're going to see here, though, um, you have what's called the homosexual agenda. And I think it's important to note in all of these groups that the left especially likes to have as their protected groups, whether maybe Islamics, homosexuals, feminists, women, blacks, um, and, you know, they call Christians radical, hatred-filled bigots all the time, is that within all of these larger groups or smaller groups, there is a radical subset. And I don't think there's anything wrong with pointing it out. You can call a spade a spade. And it, it, it makes it so we, we become unaware of things like this, where it's like if you read it, it says, you know, uh, our, our writers um, will make love between men fashionable and we will succeed because we are adept at setting styles. We will eliminate heterosexual li li liaisons through the devices of wit and ridicule, devices which we are skilled in employing. And it goes through saying that wherever men and boys are bonding together, we will be there trying to sodomize them. It's, it's, uh, and I can only wonder if this is the explanation for why you see homosexuals so overrepresented in the media. Again, 3.8% of the population, but you see shows like Modern Family, which is obviously a propaganda show trying to get a new image of what the modern family is in the average American's mind. Batman was accused of having homosexual undertones in the 1954 book Seduction of Innocence. Uh, it was basically, you know, the idea of a guy running around in black leather uh, with his little boy sidekick um, in the middle of the night. I, I believe there were other innuendos. Whether it's there or not, uh, we don't know. But Batman, as of lately, has been used for predictive programming. Here we see Bane and this sort of martial law attitude that was in the third of the uh, Batman Nolan films. This we see him using NSA-like technology to catch the Joker. And this, I believe, it leads us to society's biggest problem. As you see, uh, Morgan, Morgan Freeman, Lucius Fox, is saying, this is wrong. And he, the dialogue in the movie is he basically says, as long as this machine is here, I will not be. And it gives you the idea, though, that it's okay to do wrong things for a good reason. Because if Batman didn't do this, he wouldn't be able to catch the Joker. And this, again, is the problem that I think most people we, that has let off track, that you can do wrong for the right reason. In the video of exploiting children for political agendas, that was a reoccurring theme where they had children engaging in behavior for shock factor. And then the mothers saying, well, we don't we don't encourage our children to do this, but they knew they were doing this for a good reason. And I think that's more dangerous than just encouraging your child to say the F word because it's a word is the idea that you can do something that you know is wrong if you think you have good reason. This is, you know, self-righteousness and just will lead you down a path of moral relativism where... Where does it end? Um, we saw with the Sony leak, it came out there was a list that uh, Spider-Man basically has to be Peter Parker as we know him in all future movies. And he cannot... The thing they, they focused in on, though, was that Spider-Man has to be heterosexual. Because the actor that came out and is playing him lately made a remark being like, well, why can't Mary Jane be a guy? And, I mean, I just assume it's because he wants to be on screen kissing another man, which, if that's his prerogative, you know, more power to him. But Stanley came out, and he defended the list, and he said something that I think speaks volumes to all of these issues. And it was, um, I just see no reason to change that which has already been established when it's so easy to add new characters. I say create new characters the way you want to. And that's the thing, is I think it is, it's sort of bad when they do this, because you're you're recycling something. You're not giving them something new to look at. It seems very cheap to, uh, to just be 
re repurposing, you know, a, a character and just changing their skin color and, you know, trying to rebrand it that way. It's very cheap. I think it's pandering to people and create new characters. It makes you think that they have a bunch of guys that were sitting around saying that they're, you know, artists and creators and they're not creating anything. They're, it's it's really sad that they can't just come up with a new character. Um, Spider-Woman got in some controversy over this issue where she was bent over in a position you normally see Spider-Man in. I think it looks like a uncomfortable yoga position, but it's meant to give the impression that he's crawling around and kind of slinky like a spider. Feminists thought it was overtly sexual. I don't know if they think it's sexual when they see Spider-Man like this. Uh, so they ended up having to change the cover of the front issue after this political peer pressure stuff that goes on. We In the Avengers, I'll say, I didn't see a great deal of propaganda in the Avengers movies, but it could just be going over my head. There probably was more predictive programming in Age of Ultron, uh, the idea of drones combating in war rather than people. And uh, you did see, though, the scene where they're hiding out at Hawkeye's house, and his pregnant wife is there and informs Scarlett Johansson's character, Natalia Black Widow, that she's having a boy, and she leans over the stomach and says, traitor. So there's a little jab at men right there. Uh, besides that, I didn't see much, though, to really take issue with. Fantastic Four here. This is how we've seen them throughout the decades. Um, and then in the latest movie, you have this, where they've recasted Johnny Storm as an African-American. They also, when they were criticized about this, they came out and they said that the director chose to do it because he wanted to get the comic book team in line with real world demographics. And if you look at how this correlates with the storyline, though, the story was that Johnny is the son of this guy running the science place with the big machine they're using. And that Sue is like an adopted daughter from Russia or something like that, some, some European country. And I can say I know a lot of black families, and I don't know any of them adopting little European girls. So I really wonder what real-world demographic he's talking about. Now, one could think, though, that that storyline was added in with the black father and him running the place. Because it's a, it's a fairly, you know, it's a retelling of a story. It's not really true to the, the story, even though it's been reinvented, reissued, and retold. But it leads me with the impression that they did that just so they can't be accused of having him as a token black guy. And, but it's what it is. And it's, again, why they got pressure. You're adding a token black guy, which appears to be pandering and patronizing, instead of just creating a new character. You know, the, the Black Panther is going to be in the new Captain America Civil War movie. How silly would it be if the Black Panther was recast as a Korean woman? Or if you had Storm recast as a big, you know, Russian man of some sort, it, it would just seem odd and unnecessary when you could just create new characters. CERN, I feel there's predictive programming in this movie. They made it look like CERN a couple months beforehand. I can only believe that this is in case if something went wrong with CERN, people would have the attitude, oh, well, that's just like the Fantastic Four movie. It moves the normalcy bias and the Overton window, so when something does go wrong and it ends up being a major issue that people are normalized to it, we saw uh, there's compilation clips on YouTube where you can see in movies 9-11 the Twin Towers burning down so many times, a ridiculous amount of times in movies, and it just leaves people, you know, when it, stuff like this really happens, they say, that's just like in a movie. You know, you've seen them do compilation videos about how all the original James Bond gadgets are now stuff the everyday person has in their life. So there's a predictive programming aspect to this stuff. The Seduction of Innocence came out in 1954. It was a comic book by a psychiatrist basically saying comic books were leading to delinquency and degeneracy. So all of the companies adopted the Comics Code of Authority, which basically said um, they're not going to show drug use and gore and sexuality, overtly sexual stuff in the comics. 
this was eventually, uh, they all stopped employing it as they all started to tackle the drug issue in the 80s. Uh, here you see Harry Osborne on pills. You see the Teen Titans with the President's Drug Awareness Campaign doing an issue. Iron Man became an alcoholic. You have the Green Arrow also having someone become a junkie in the storyline. So it became a reoccurring thing where uh, drug use was negatively portrayed in comics, which, you know, you want to you want to think that if you're putting it out there and showing it as being bad, that people would get that point. But I think we've seen with the D.A.R.E. program, the sex ed program, and death ed in schools that the complete opposite happens. You're introducing these ideas in a way to kids, especially through fantasy, where they're not getting a realistic impression about it. Um, comic book propaganda, there were also one-off comic books delving into certain issues. Um, abortion was one of them. You had Abortion Eve, which was a pro-abortion comic where they're talking about it. Um, the pros, the cons, you know, and basically rationalizing it to women. They also had Who Killed Junior, though, which was an anti-abortion comic book. The Civil Rights, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story was depicted in comic books. So we, we can, you know, propaganda is a neutral term, and we need to realize that. And once you realize that, that it's not always bad, but you are propagating an idea in someone's mind, you're trying to influence them. Now, that can have a negative connotation because you're trying to sell someone on, a, on an idea, something, you know, like in the Batman ones, an idea that we should be morally object to, but we see these characters that we, we enjoy employing these ideas, so then we might be a little less likely to ob object to it when it's already become rationalized in our heads at some point. So... That's a little look at some of the comic book propaganda and social engineering that I've found as of recent. And we can hope this video doesn't get blocked by Disney. I hope you all enjoyed. Be sure to check out the other videos and subscribe. And this has been Jamie Starr with the New World News.